I have thoroughly enjoyed this series that we've been doing on Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Do not forget all his benefits, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. We've been hearing each week of these promises of God that the psalmist David is praising and blessing God for what we are, what he has received. And we in Christ, in the power of the resurrection, have received that and so much more because of the assurance that we have in the power of the risen Christ, the promise of the Holy Spirit that we receive. And so this series has been a huge encouragement to me, and I hope that it is also an encouragement to you. And this morning we learn that we in Christ have been crowned with steadfast love and mercy. The question that was on the screen during the break had some, was something like this. If you knew that you couldn't fail, what would you be willing to try? What risk would you be willing to take? There's a sense of that in this text, that in Christ, we have been crowned. We have been welcomed. We have been assured of our place with him in eternity. Because of that, as we heard last week from John, we need not fear. There is nothing that is going to separate us from the redemption that we have in Christ. What kind of freedom comes with that? And this morning, as we consider what it means to be crowned with steadfast love and mercy, we will hear again God's good news to us and we will celebrate and bless his name with all that we are. Just a week or so ago, there was a, a huge event that happened over a in England. Did you hear anything about it? Uh, this, this guy named Charles, Prince Charles, became crowned as the King of the United Kingdom. Wasn't it fantastic? How many of you were up, like, you know, and watching the whole day's worth of events? Some of you love that stuff. Others of you couldn't be bothered. Apparently, one of the soccer team's fans over in the UK were less than enthused and told him to shove it somewhere. Whatever you think about King Charles, he was crowned the sovereign of the United Kingdom last week. What did he do to deserve that, by the way? Does anyone know? Is he some sort of strong military political leader that has saved his country from the invading forces of another nation? No, not the last I checked. Is he some philosopher king who has brought some truth and ideals that has uplifted their nation and united them as a people? Not last I checked. So why does he get a crown? Why not someone else? Well, you see, whether you think it's the right way for things to be or not, in our world and in the political systems of our world, kingship and crowns are passed from generation to generation. King Charles is king because his mother was regent before him, the queen. He receives this honor because he was born. That's it. That's the only thing that he did to deserve that crown. He was born to someone who was a queen. Here in this text, we read this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. A crown symbolizes many things, but above all, it is a symbol of honor, a symbol of belonging to the right family. We read 
in Ephesians chapter 1, these words, For God chose us in him, Jesus, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, in his steadfast love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Each of us who have heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and have believed in him have been welcomed in as sons and daughters of God. And because God, who is the king of all kings, confers on the, us this welcome into his family, we are crowned as his children. Now, there are some who have used these words and this idea of being the children of God, who is the king of all kings, to say that makes every single one of us princes and princesses, right? And because of that, that we have some sort of, you know, exalted status, in fact, you know, we should probably be able to go to the king and say, well, I'm part of the royal family, so I deserve honors and all and anything that I need or want. This is a dangerous and subtle kind of twisting of the meaning of this, of this adoption that we have received into the family of the king of kings. In Romans 8, 17, it talks about this idea of being inheritors together with Christ, family members of God's holy family. In 8.17, it says this, Now, if we are children of God, then we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. We belong. But then it goes on to say, If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory, it's not all about now I am a child of the king and now I deserve honor and respect and God's just going to pour out all these blessings on me whenever I ask. That's not it at all. Being invited into the family of God to experience his steadfast love and his mercy is so that we can walk as his children in this world. I'm going to walk with you through a number of texts this morning talk to us about this idea of being crowned and what that looks like and what it can mean. Being crowned is a sign of honor, a sign of glory. In Proverbs 4 verse 9, we read this, wisdom will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. It's this idea that if you walk in wisdom that comes from God, that you will be lifted up that people will see that wisdom in you and will honor God, and you too will be honored. But there is even more. There's a sense of being honored for your place and for how you live. In Proverbs 12, verse 4, for Mother's Day, here we go, a wife of noble character is her husband's crown. It's a saying that means that when someone who is with you and is a companion and a partner in your life is someone whose character shines forth with the goodness of God, that shine comes onto you and makes you look good. That goes both ways. It's not just your wives make your husbands look good. It's also the other way around. That when we have noble character, we make those who are around us and who walk with us shine and receive glory and honor. In Philippians 4, verse 1, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes to the church and talks to them about who they are as they have received Christ and walk with him in this good news of the gospel. He says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and I long for, you are my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. The fact that we walk together in the gospel of Jesus Christ honors the ones who have shared that good news with us. Paul says, your faith 
is like a crown on my head. If you go back into the days of that time, the ancient Near East, and how they honored those who won the Olympic Games, for instance, they would receive a wreath of leaves to put on their head. And someone who was even more highly exalted, they would take that wreath of leaves and they would make it out of gold. It wasn't just a king that wore this, but it was someone who was worthy of glory and honor. When we live in such a way that we honor God with our lives, you are placing a crown on the heads of those who have shared that good news with you. But it goes on to talk about a different kind of crown, the crown that each one of us as followers of Jesus, as his disciples have received. And this is a crown of life, a crown of righteousness that we receive in faith through Jesus Christ. In James 1 verse 12, it says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There is reward, honor, that is given to those who follow Christ faithfully, who have heard his words to follow me, lay down your life, pick up your cross, and walk with me. And in that faithfulness, as we walk with him, we receive honor from God as we get to our eternal reward. The Apostle Paul, again, in his letter to, the, to Timothy, one of his, men, his mentees, says this at the end of his life. In first Tim, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8, he says to Timothy, I've fought that good fight. I've persevered, as it says in James. I have finished this race, and I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. These are examples of the steadfast love of God poured out on us. Why? How is it that we deserve this steadfast love? How is it that we deserve these crowns? We don't. We haven't done anything to earn them. It's the grace of God as he welcomes us into his family, adopts us as his own, and says, you have received this new birth in Christ that makes you part of the royal family of heaven. Here is your crown. Walk with me. Live into the honor, the righteousness that is part of that blessing that I have given to you. How do we know? How do we know that these crowns of life, crown of righteousness, that we will live in this way and that we will, as Paul says, get to the end of that race in faithfulness? In Psalm 103, it says, we have been crowned with steadfast love. Steadfast means ongoing, enduring, persevering love. The love of God doesn't fail. It never, ever fails. In Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, it says this, When you believed, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. The promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing your inheritance that promise of sonship, adoption into the family of God, sons and daughters of the King, is sealed by the Holy Spirit that is given to you. And that Holy Spirit walks with you, empowers you, and sanctifies you. What do you mean, sanctifies you? Well, we'll get there in just a second. But what does it mean? Why am I using this word, the seal that you have received in God, 
when we're talking about being crowned. Well, there's a verse, verse in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, that talks about those who are around the throne of God, those who have walked this, this path with Jesus, those who have run the race with perseverance. It says in Revelation 14, verse 1, in the vision of John, he says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, which is the holy mountain of God, and with him 144,000 who had his name and the Father's name written on their foreheads. Have you ever been, like, kind of troubled by that imagery? How many of you are ready for the tattoo that has Jesus' name and the name of the Father on your forehead? I mean, tattoos are getting really popular, but face tattoos still are a little bit, eh, right? What does this mean that you're, there's this seal on their foreheads with the name of Jesus and the name of the Father? And how does this tie to being a crown? Well, you see, the crown of life and the crown of, uh, of righteousness, of a holy life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit, is not the only crown that we receive. We also receive what is called a crown of consecration. Crown of consecration. Consecration means something that is set apart, made holy and sacred for God's purposes. Hear these words from Exodus way back in the Old Testament of the story of the people of God coming out of the land of Egypt and as God, through Moses, is setting up their system of worship and how they will honor and serve this God who has freed them from their bondage and their slavery in Egypt. Here in Exodus 39, they are describing the vestments, the robes, and the trappings of Aaron, who will be the high priest for the nation of Israel. In verse 30, it says this, they made a rosette, it's like a little plaque, of the holy diadem of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And they tied it to a blue cord to fasten it on the turban above as the Lord had commanded Moses. Aaron the high priest Whenever he enters the tabernacle, whenever he enters the presence of God, he is wearing on his head a gold diadem that says, Holy to the Lord. He is consecrated to the Lord. Now, here's the connection for us. You and I are called a royal priesthood. First Peter, you and I take that place in Jesus to come before the throne of God wearing a crown of consecration that says, this person, this one here is holy to the Lord. Each one of us has received that crown. No wonder the psalmist can say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who crowns me with steadfast love and mercy. And mercy. What does it mean to be crowned with mercy? In the text that we read earlier this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we read this. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Now this echoes some of the words that we read from Ephesians just a few minutes ago. But look at that first part, the first part of this phrase. Who is it? Who is it that accomplishes this for us, that makes us righteous, that keeps us holy to the Lord? 
Who is it that ensures that in this race that we run with our lives, that we will endure to the end? Do you see it? Who is it? It's not me. It's not my will. It's not my strength. It's not everything that is uh, that I am. No, it is God. It is God who makes us to stand firm in Christ. And this is the mercy of God poured out on us. Because if it was up to my strength, if it was up to my will, I would fail moments, literally moments after receiving that crown. Because I fail, I stumble, I doubt, I fall. But God's mercy endures. God's steadfast love is poured out generation to generation, and he does not fail. He anoints us. He pours his spirit into us and puts that seal on us so that, as we read in Revelation, we will too be part of that crowd gathered around the throne. Are you sure? But Yeah. And you, you heard the number, there were 144,000, and there's a lot more than 144,000 Christians that I'm aware of. So what, are you sure that I'm going to be one of those 144,000? Well, if you, someone knocked on your door recently that uh, wanted to share some news from the scriptures with you and said that they're from a certain religious organization, they'd say, no, actually that 144,000, that number is full. Uh, you, get, you get to be close to God, but you don't get to be part of the 144,000. Um, but that's not what that means. The number 144,000 is symbolic. It represents a number, uh, uh, it's divisible by 12. It's 12 by, times 12 is 144. 12 in scripture is a number of completeness, wholeness, entirety, the whole thing coming, coming together. And a thousand in, the, in this idea of a symbolic numbers in scripture, a thousand is so much that it cannot be counted. 144,000 means everyone who has faith in Christ and has received that crown of life, that crown of righteousness, that crown of consecration will be there at the throne. You and I have this as, what does it say? A guarantee of what is to come. And for that, you and I can say, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Do not forget all his benefits, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Would you say these words with me from Psalm 103, verse 1? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. Thank you.